So my talk today is what's the value of an endangered language, indigenous language and identity in rural Taiwan. You've probably heard that languages are dying out at a remarkable pace, that within 80 years, we could lose at least half of the world's 7,000 languages. Less often do we hear why this matters. Perhaps someone will say that it's a huge loss for science because uh, the, uh, one second, oh, here we go. Uh, someone will say that it's a huge loss for science because the knowledge we could gain by understanding linguistic diversity. Indeed, it's exciting to learn about an Amazonian language that lacks recursion or an Austri Australian Aborigine language where one says north or south instead of left or right when pointing to a piece of food stuck on someone's face. Oh, that's something on the north side of your face. Or they might highlight the scientific knowledge embedded in indigenous languages, the kind of knowledge which has helped biologists identify new species of plants. And then there are the doubters. There are those who will say it really doesn't matter if languages die out. Isn't it just natural that some languages will fade away and other languages will replace them? It has been happening for thousands of years. Why try to stop it? Isn't it a matter of personal choice what language we choose to speak to our children? Well, it is true that language is always changing. The English I'm using to speak to you today isn't the English of Shakespeare or Chaucer. It isn't true that the way language changes is natural or inevitable. It is only since the rise of nation states and mass public education, when language policy became a tool of nation building, that we began to see it in this way. In the 19th and 20th century, gave birth to a seeming endless list of crimes against colonized and minority peoples, including the crime of linguicide, government policies that intentionally or unintentionally bring about the death of a language. How can we call speaking an endangered language a choice if someone's parents and grandparents weren't allowed to speak it? The historical reality of linguicide gives us another reason for preserving endangered languages, justice. According to such a view, reviving a language is part of a larger process of decolonization. As an anthropologist, however, my job is not to provide a moral philosophical basis for preserving endangered languages. Rather, I see my job as trying to understand why people who are teaching or learning these languages actually do so. Here we can draw from our own experiences to see how such distant motivations might be from the lofty ideals of science, knowledge, and justice. I studied French in high school. I didn't do it because I had a love of French philosophy or literature. I wasn't driven by dreams of romance. No, I just wanted to graduate high school. And learning French was a requirement. As a result, I only learned enough French to pass my high school ex exam, and I promptly forgot all of it after I graduated. Now, I must emphasize that many people involved in teaching and studying indigenous languages in Taiwan are motivated much more motivated than I was in high school as a French student. That's not what I want to apply. Rather, my argument is very simple. If we actually care about saving the world's endangered languages, we need to understand the motivations and values of the people studying those languages, as well as those of their teachers, parents, and the institutions where they work. For the past two decades, I've been undertaking ethnographic fieldwork on this topic in Hualien County on the east coast of Taiwan, home to the Bangza speaking people, also known as Amis or Ameizu. With a population of about 210,000 people, the Bangza are the Taiwan's largest indigenous ethnic group, one of 16 officially recognized indigenous groups in Taiwan who make up a total of about 2% of Taiwan's total population. What do we mean when we use the term indigenous in relation to Taiwan? The short version is that the term refers to speakers of Austronesian languages whose ancestors came to Taiwan between four and 10,000 years ago and have cultures very distinct from the speakers of Sinitic languages like Holo and Hakka, who only started coming over to Taiwan from Southern China about 400 years ago. The linguist side of Taiwan's Austronesian languages began under Japanese colonial rule in the 1920s and 30s when public schooling was first introduced in indigenous areas. 
it accelerated in the early years of KMT rule after the Speak Mandarin campaign was launched in the 1950s. During that time, students were regularly punished for speaking their native dialects or fang yan. As a result of these policies, parents across Taiwan began speaking Mandarin to their children at home. While these policies affected Han and indigenous families alike, the impact was far from equal. For thousands of years, Taiwan's Austronesian peoples had orally transmitted their knowledge and culture down from one generation to the next. As a result, there were few written texts or recordings in any of these languages, apart from a few made by Japanese anthropologists and Christian missionaries. As a result, once that chain of oral transmission was broken, there was little left to keep it alive. Military rule ended in 1987, and with it, so did these policies responsible for linguicide. But ending linguicide and reviving languages are two very different things. There were already two generations of children who had been brought up speaking Mandarin. Today, few indigenous people under the age of 60 have even the most basic command of their mother tongue. To truly undo the damage of decades of linguicidal policies would take a major national effort. And from the outside, it looks like this is what Taiwan has undertaken. Since 2001, when indigenous languages were first introduced in the elementary school curriculum, there's been a tremendous amount of activity in Taiwan. The government has sponsored new textbooks, dictionaries, collections of folklore and oral histories, children's books, language nests, speech competitions, teacher training, language certification, linguistic research, and so on. It's really quite impressive. And many of my friends and colleagues are deeply involved in these heroic efforts. And I see a couple of them in the audience here today. So I applaud their work. But there's a problem. It isn't working, at least not if reversing linguicide is the actual end goal of these programs. Even after 20 years of efforts, most Pangza youth are unable to even have a basic conversation in their mother tongue. Perhaps I'm just being impatient. These things do take time. But there isn't much time to lose. For one thing, most indigenous Taiwanese are fortunate to still have a population of native speakers that they can talk to. But these native speakers are already quite old and not likely to be with us for much longer. To better understand these issues, I want to share three stories with you. Each of these illustrates some of the reasons why I think these policies have so far failed to reverse linguicide. These stories also trace the course of my fieldwork over the past decade, ending with my most recent research project, a year-long ethnographic study of a community-based Bangza language education program called Language in the Village. So my first story is about my own failure to learn an endangered language and how that failure gave birth to my pro current project. Around 2009, I decided I would finally learn Bangza. Even though I had already spent several years studying efforts to teach and revitalize the Bangza language, it was the subject of my PhD dissertation, I had never attempted to learn it myself. The reason was simple. I had been too busy trying to learn and improve my Chinese to be able to focus on learning a second completely unrelated language. By 2009, my Chinese fluency had already gotten to a level where it was no longer an issue, giving me time to put my attention at learning Bangza. I was also lucky to be one of the few universities in Taiwan, or the world for that matter, that offer Pangza language classes. So for several years, I diligently attended these, as well as classes at the Hualien Indigenous Community College. I also engaged a private tutor and started a Pangza English language exchange as well. I worked very hard. I memorized lessons, made flashcards, practiced pronunciation of myself while walking the dog. Despite all of this, I made very little progress and felt very frustrated. By 2013, I was still unable to hold even a basic conversation in Bangza, and my vocabulary remained quite limited. Ironically, during the same period, my Chinese had improved much faster than my Bangza had, even though I wasn't studying that language. I don't think it was a coincidence. I began to make note of how much time was spent in my Bangza classes speaking each language. And while I don't have exact statistics, I feel confident in saying that it was not unusual for more than half of class time to be spent speaking Mandarin, often much more. So I think there are four important reasons why Chinese was used in these classrooms. First, 
even when the majority of the students were Bangza themselves, they generally lacked the most basic ability in the language, forcing the teacher to use Mandarin to lead the class. Second, the teachers tended to be older, having themselves learned Mandarin, English, and even Japanese at a time when grammar translation was the dominant approach to classroom pedagogy. They had had little exposure to newer teaching methods focused on communicative competence that are now current in many foreign language classrooms. Nor did they receive much training in language teaching pedagogy before they became language teachers. Third, the ultimate purpose of many of these classes for both parents and students is not linguistic fluency or communicative competence, but the certification granted to those who pass the indigenous language proficiency tests. This is required for access to many government programs and benefits targeted at indigenous youth. The lower levels of this test are not very difficult and students well-trained in test-taking skills can pass them without really being able to speak the language. Although that's not true at the higher levels, very few students progress past the lowest. The fourth reason might seem surprising, but I came to believe that almost nobody involved in studying or teaching endangered languages actually expects people to use these languages as a means of daily communication at any point in their life. Well, someone learning English would be expected to use English in their daily life, in school, in work, in travel. This is not true of Bangsa students. True, there are places where one can still use these languages on a daily basis, such as when you find a bunch of elders speaking to each other in a village setting, uh, in a market or sitting out in front of their homes late at night. But even in such environments, no one expects young people to use the mother tongue in more than a cursory way. In this sense, we can say Bangda is being taught as what we might call a heritage language. Now, I'm quite familiar with this model because I had the same experience as a kid. As a Jewish kid living in New York City, I studied Hebrew once a week at Hebrew school. Although Hebrew is now a living language in the state of Israel, we were not learning the language with any expectation that we would ever use it to speak to Israelis. Rather, it was primarily taught as part of preparations for the coming of age ritual, the bar mitzvah, during which we're expected to read a few words from the Torah in a religious ceremony. It seems to me that many Bangza youth were doing something quite similar. That is to say, indigenous language proficiency serves the same function for indigenous youth in Taiwan that Torah recitation does for reformed Jews in New York City. It's a mark of identity, not a tool for communication. Now, this isn't necessarily a bad thing. This kind of language learning serves a purpose. It connects people to their cultural heritage. The point of, cult of heritage language learning is not to gain fluency, but to learn about the values and traditions that are associated with the language and the culture. One could say that language here is a tool to connect people to their past. If we look at it this way, we can see it makes sense to spend much of the class time speaking Mandarin, because teachers are using the language as a tool to teach about their culture, rather than trying to teach the language itself. Typically, a teacher would write a word or a sentence on the board, everyone would repeat it a few times, and then the teacher would spend 10 to 15 minutes talking about the word or phrase in Mandarin, explaining the concepts and cultural context for the word. In a sense, then, I was the odd one out. Having come to these classes, very different expectations from everyone else. The failure was a failure of my expectations, not a failure of the class or the teacher. The second story started as a result of my sharing the frustrations I was feeling at the time with my Bangza language exchange partner, who also happened to be the director of the Hualien Indigenous Community College, where I was taking classes at the time. It turns out that he'd come to a similar conclusion it was already taking steps to try and change things. He too wanted to see Bangza revived as a living language among the younger generation. The director had just a few years earlier spent some time visiting the Maori in New Zealand. He had first gone there as a public health worker, but was struck by how the Maori placed their language and culture at the center of indigenous health initiatives. This led him to make a number of changes in his own life, including leaving the public health field for work and education. At the time we spoke, he was organizing a series of workshops to try and train local teachers in a Maori approach to language pedagogy known as Te Aterange. Te Aterange, now widely used by the Maori, is based on the silent way, which emphasizes speaking over writing and immersion over grammar and translation. Silent Way, first developed by Caleb Gatengno in 1963, uses cuisine air rods and picture books to encourage students to speak and correct each other's mistakes with minimal input from the teacher. 
Ta'a Tarange was developed by Maori activists in the 1970s and modifies the silent way by emphasizing traditional Maori customs and values. When I attended the HICC workshops in Te Atarangi, a lot of time was spent emphasizing these principles and the importance of incorporating indigenous values into education. While admirable, I could see that it wasn't working as intended. Part of this was because the focus on indigenous values did little to help teachers understand the pedagogical principles underlying the success of Te Atarangi. But part of it was also the pressure on teachers to teach to the test, which many felt was incompatible with the Te Atarangi approach. One of the strengths of the silent way upon which Te Atarange is based is that students are given the basic information they need in order to discover linguistic principles on their own without explicitly teaching those principles. For instance, if I was teaching English in Taiwan, I might hold up one blue Cuisinaire rod and say one blue rod, and then hold up three and say three blue rods. In this way, students can learn how to form plural without having to explain the concept to them in Chinese. During the months I was attending these workshops, almost none of the teachers were able to grasp this fundamental pedagogical concept. There were two exceptions. A teacher who had previously been exposed to the silent way when he had been an English teacher, and another had been to New Zealand while receiving te, uh, training in Te when he was there, when she was there. Even more of a problem, however, was the fact that Te Atarange prioritizes communicative and oral competence over literacy. This conflicts with the needs of some students, many of whom need to take the National Indigenous Language Proficiency Test. One of the teachers at the workshops, an older woman who taught the Gavalan language, would constantly spend workshop time worrying about the lack of standardization in the Gavalan orthography even though the workshop leaders kept emphasizing that the Te Atarangi approach didn't introduce writing until much later. It became clear that she saw her job primarily in terms of training students for these tests and was therefore unwilling to accept the goal of the workshop. And she wasn't the only teacher who felt this way. In the end, HICC decided to abandon the teacher training program. The director explained to me that he felt experienced teachers had to unlearn too much before they could start learning something new and he felt it would be better to train younger teachers who didn't have so much baggage. He also felt it might be difficult to implement these principles in a school system directed from the top down by Taiwan's Ministry of Education. He hoped that eventually indigenous peoples in Taiwan could have their own schools where they would be freer to implement alternative approaches to pedagogy. My third and last story starts in 2016. When funded by a government research grant, I spent a year studying a program run by Banai, a teacher I'd met during the Te Atarange training classes. She's the one who'd gone to New Zealand and received training in Te Atarange. She was eager to try and implement some of what she had learned there in her own community. Using grant money targeted for indigenous language initiatives, she and her partner started Language in the Village, which brought young people together to participate in real life activities in the village setting, often surrounded by old people who still use the language for communication in Bangza. Banai is a Bunun woman who married into a Bangza family. After she married, her husband asked her to help take care of her parents, neither of whom spoke Mandarin. She felt looked down upon, telling me she felt treated like a servant in their house while her, father, her husband was away. Trapped in the house, not even allowed to attend services at her own Catholic church, she finally decided the only solution was to fully embrace the language, food, and culture of her in-laws. Not only did this improve the situation at home, but when the government started promoting language education in the community, it gave her a legitimate reason to leave the house. Her experience at the HICC program and, uh, and later in New Zealand had shown her new possibilities for teaching Bangsa, but she still struggled to implement these concepts in a Taiwanese context. Despite the lofty goals of the program, the limited amount of time and resources available meant that it was severely constrained in its ability to create an environment where students use Bangza as the meeting of meaning, a medium of communication during class time. In the end, most of the students' speech in Bangza was uh, produced through elicitation and prompting, much like a traditional classroom. They often repeated after the teacher or sang songs together or responded in very short, limited utterances. Never did I hear a naturally occurring conversation. After class, when breaking to eat, they always spoke to each other in Mandarin, 
The language in the village program relies upon government funds for staff, supplies, and travel costs. In order to get these funds, they had to compete with other indigenous language programs that followed more traditional textbook-based models. And the state expected them to provide traditional course plans and methods for evaluating the students. Here, Banai employed what was essentially a weapons of the weak approach, following the state's demands in a purely superficial and perfunctory manner. For instance, the students would come back to the classroom at the end of the day or the next week and make drawings, which they would then adore with bangza words, which the teacher and other students would help them spell. These paintings thus constitute a kind of written evaluation, which could be used to show that they were following traditional teaching principles, even as the entire class was designed precisely to try and move away from such a model. So by way of wrapping up, I wanna share uh, two lessons which can be learned from these three stories. First is the idea that language learning can serve many different purposes. It can help reconnect people with their heritage. It can give people a sense of identity. It can connect young people to their elders in their community. It can be a tool used by the state to determine who gets recognized as an indigenous and who does not. For many of these purposes, it doesn't really matter if people are truly able to speak the language with any degree of fluency or not. It might be enough to take a class or pass a test or perform in a competition, which is not to say that it isn't important for these languages to spoke, be spoken, it is, but not necessarily for the people taking the classes or for those teaching the classes, or even for those distributing the funds to pay for the classes. In the end, only a small group of dedicated language activists and students seem to truly care about reversing linguicide and revitalizing these languages as tools of daily communication. The second is how things might look different if conversational fluency was the actual goal of these programs. For one thing, classes might be every day or at least several times a week, not just once a week. The material would focus on useful day-to-day -day topics, such as inviting someone to dinner in a movie, rather than on cultural practices like hunting and weaving that are no longer common in the lives of today's uh, indigenous young people. And the classes would be taught entirely in the target language, not via translation. There are actually bilingual programs in Taiwan that follow such principles, but they're focused on teaching English, not indigenous languages. Such schools are only a dream for those working to revive indigenous languages. So what is to be done? Well, one option, which I just wrote about a paper about uh, in a co-authored paper with the former HICC chair, who is now also my PhD student, is to focus on teaching languages at home. But what happens when kids go to school? Even though the home environment is key, all that work can be wasted if the schools don't reinforce and support what is happening at home. But it's a vicious circle because the schools don't feel it is worth supporting these languages until families demonstrate that they actually want their kids to learn to speak them. Looking at New Zealand, another option appears, which is to give indigenous people more control over their own schooling. In New Zealand, one can go from preschool all the way to a PhD, taking classes primarily taught in the Maori language. Now, social science would be taught in the Maori language. Taiwan is a long way from that, but there are a few small scale experiments, though it remains to be seen how much autonomy these schools will really have. There's also the problem of finding teachers with the necessary language proficiency to teach social science or math in an indigenous language rather than in Mandarin. It might be easier for Bangta, which has a larger population, but for other languages with smaller communities of speakers, it, they will struggle to find sufficient staff. Still, schools that value indigenous language as a means for communication can have a positive impact on families and the wider community, fostering a sense that these languages still matter and don't just belong in a museum. The process of decolonization requires more than just dictionaries and textbooks. It requires indigenous sovereignty over their own education. Thank you.